Welcome, though. Uh, I just want to start um, real quick with just a little video message here for all of you guys, uh, given today's day. A weird weekend episode about rap. Can you remember any of the rap that you did? My money don't jingle jingle, it falls. I like to see wiggle wiggle, for sure. And make me wanna dribble dribble, you know, right in my beard. It is Father's Day, so first of all, happy Father's Day to uh, everyone out there. Um, I know that that's a f it's, a f it's a fun day. I know for some people it's a tough day. So um, when you have those kind of hurt, there's, we're broken people, I'll tell you right now. Uh, and sometimes we put that brokenness on our kids. And so my prayer today, even this morning, is for people that are in that situation, that, that there's, there is a redemption, there is a redeeming ability. <laughs> the Holy Spirit can do that and can work because what happens is the enemy uses that to try to place a block so we can't relate to God the Father. And so that's, whether you have a, a, an amazing father, whether it was a tough situation, um, that, that's my prayer, is that the Holy Spirit does that redeeming work no matter what. Because I'll tell you right now, even on this day, I'm every single day, I've got three very little kids, I am just impressed and struck by how completely inadequate and a terrible father I am. So there's your anti-Father's uh, Day <laughs> message. I'm completely inadequate. I can't do it. I'm not good at it. But the good news and the wonderful thing here is that that's exactly where God steps in. That's exactly the role that he fills. And he says, okay, you are inadequate, and that's okay. You have to lean on me. And I'm not, so I get to be inadequate, and I get to have Jesus step in and fill that void and lift everything up, and it's his, it's his grace, his mercy, his redemption um, that really ends up letting us well, be any, any sort of successful <laughs> parent at whatsoever. But today we are going to stop. We're, we're done with Ezekiel, um, which is good because I, I can't do that. Uh, we're going back. Last, uh, last, last summer, if you're with us, we had a series called Foundations. We're kind of doing this in the summer. It's really just taking us going back. What's back to basics? Let's look at just where we are, let's get back to the basics. And so Brad was out of town, he asked me, can you do this? I said, oh, Brad, I'm a lawyer, I can talk. Uh, trust me, <laughs> trust me, I can do that. Um, and he says, okay, great, We're gonna, I want you to talk about the church and what it is and its purpose. I said, Brad, well, see, now I've done it too, I think, oh, there we go, it all, it all lit up now. I, see, the more things are changed, the more they stay the same. Uh, so... I said, oh, great, Brad, thanks, uh, the church. Answering what is it and its purpose, um, you realize that this is what happens every single time. This is uh, just a graphic. It doesn't really matter, but it starts Christianity, and it just splits off into all these different things. And I said, Brad, that's what happens when someone tries to answer that question of what is the church uh, and what its purpose is. So I'll see half of you next week. The other half will go with Brad is, I guess, what's going to happen at the end of the sermon based on the chart. But um, I guaranteed him, I said, we're, we're going to try to keep the heresy to a minimum so there's not so much cleanup you have to do. But with that, uh, what is the church? We all kind of know it because we're here, right? Like we all showed up to this building at this time. But if someone asked you just that question, what is it? You, you kind of think about, yeah, it's, it's the people. It's the people. The church and the context that we're going to look at it today, because you can go about a million different ways talking for 20 minutes on this. But the context that we're going to look at is the church is all believers over the entirety of history. Every single one of us. Whether we're here right now, 20 years in the future, 1,000 years in the past. That's what the church is. That's what we have. And we know this, and we talk about this a little bit, and the Bible does this. Uh, like I said, I'm a lawyer, but I, I, do, I can read the Bible, so we, we do have some Bible scripture in here. But Ephesians 2, 19 through 22 talks about this, um, this idea. And I'll apologize right now. I guess here's the first act of heresy. I'm going to use the message, um, which, uh, so for, for any... Uh, 
King James only people out there, I apologize. Uh, I, I'm using the message. But he talks about this. Paul writes to the church and he says, God is building a home. He's using all of us, no matter how we got here, in what he's building. He's used the apostles and the prophets as the foundation. Now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. And we see it taking place every day. A holy temple built by God, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. So that's what it's about. I, I think we all can agree there, right, that the church is not these four walls. Thank goodness if, if the church was quite literally these four walls right here, um, we'd really be taking it on the chin. Uh, it'd be, it, it would be probably a pretty depressing sight to say, oh, this is, this is the church? This is it? Okay. That'd be pretty tough, but it's not. It's, it's all the people through all time. But again, I was like, okay, this is really cool. Um, I was looking at it, I said, well, awesome verse. The people, good job, let's pack it up, get home, lunch, let's go. This doesn't really answer the question, what is the church, what is it like, okay. There's a lot of metaphors, and, and we use a lot of metaphors, and we see a lot of metaphors in the Bible for what the church is, partly because it is this nebulous idea. And so everyone's trying to explain what is the church? There's some very basic guidelines about what the church is, but we're trying to figure out what is it? How do I explain a heavenly idea to people here on earth? How do we, how do we explain that? How do we figure that out? So one of the metaphors that, that I like is really the church as the kingdom of God. That's, we hear that referenced over and over again, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And that's, that's kind of like what the church is. It's kind of like a kingdom. But we see, and we see this, John the Baptist talks about it, Philip talks about it, Paul, Jesus himself says this is kind of, this is what it's like. And if you really want, you can go back into the archives. I know uh, Brad already did a sermon kind of like on the, what the kingdom looks like. Uh, so I'm not stealing that. It looks a little bit different than that. But go back, you can go back and listen to those. He, he does a great job. But couple things that we have to remember when we're looking at the church and the kingdom of God, because that's an imperfect metaphor. It, it's not quite right. None of it will be quite right. But there's a couple things that this does bring out, and it does help us learn about what the church actually is. But we have to start with the first part, and we have to get this part right. The church is not the kingdom. The church is not the kingdom. The kingdom is a, a perfect reign, a perfect place where Jesus reigns forever, where it's not me and it's not Brad or it's not whoever else is up here talking about it because we can get it wrong. The kingdom is with our heavenly father reigning in perfect peace, in perfect love and perfect joy. That's not this. And we see that People, honestly, probably here and in this church, hopefully not, but we're human, so I'll probably, people have probably been hurt by something that's happened here at this church. People have probably been hurt by other churches at other churches. That's not what the kingdom looks like. But the church is still important. We talk about this and we, even, this is John talking about it when he's kind of giving this a little bit right before, uh, he, right before Jesus, right before there's baptizing, it's Matthew 3, verses 1 through 3. And it says, while Jesus was still living in the Galilean hills, John called the, John called the baptizer was preaching in the desert country of Judea. And his message was simple and austere, like his desert surroundings. Change your life. God's kingdom is here. So the kingdom is here, but the church is not the actual kingdom. Not this church, not the church down the street, not all of us as the collection as the church. And Jesus says this as well. And he says in Matthew 4, 17, he, he picks up right where John left off when he starts his ministry. 
change your life, God's kingdom is here. And this is something that they actually pull from Isaiah. So when we were talking about Ezekiel last, uh, the last couple weeks and how it's actually pulled through, Jesus and John the Baptist are actually also pulling from Isaiah, pulling out to the people, saying, look, no, no, God's kingdom is here. God's kingdom is here. And that's what Jesus wants to talk about. But, but this church or the collection of churches, we're not the kingdom. We're not the kingdom. Because the kingdom is what creates the church. The kingdom is what creates the church. And guys, we get in trouble here. I think especially, well, here, here's the Nate Marsh soapbox for you. But we get in trouble here, especially in the American church, because I think we flip this. We flip this. We put this backwards and we say, no, it's the church that creates the kingdom. And so it's up to us. We are the ones that have to advance the kingdom. If we're not doing our work, what's going to happen? It's up to us. That's why we get lost in all the other things. Jesus plus, Jesus plus, Jesus plus, Jesus plus. Because we've got it flipped. It's the kingdom that created the church. It's Jesus who came here who saved us, and he talks about that over and over and over again. And it's important, it says, do not, do not forsake the gathering of the believers as we talk about this, because it's kingdom first. The church is just the mechanism. The church is just the representation. So when we get, but when we get this flipped, that's when we end up saying, we have to gain political power or we have to gain economic power, or we have to gain whatever, because the kingdom depends on us. That's when we get it flipped, and we get ourselves into a whole lot of trouble. What we have to remember is that God's word, God's kingdom, the end is already written. The end's already written. His kingdom will advance his kingdom will reign. He will be king. Whether the church does it or not, whether we do what we're supposed to do, God already has this. So we have to remember the priority. It is the kingdom first which created the church. Otherwise, we're going to be down a whole host of slippery problems. Uh, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. We have to remember as well because it's the church that witnesses to the kingdom. Again, remember the order that we have to have. The kingdom is above. The church is imperfect. It's the church that witnesses to the kingdom. It's the church that says, look, look, I'm an ambassador. This is, I'm, I'm trying to present to you Jesus Christ and his perfect reign. Because we're living in a time where we have the church, and this is partly why it's imperfect, this metaphor. But we're living in a time where we're saying, the kingdom is here, but it's not yet. And we're living in this time, and so what we're called to do, what the church does, and what the church is, is a witness to the kingdom. To say, look, everybody, you can have a slice of the kingdom right now. But there's something better. There's something better coming. We can show you a piece. We can, we can give you kind of what happens. But there's something else. And there's something better. The kingdom is better. That's better. That's better. And again, we get this flipped as well. And this is, again, one of my concerns and the prayers that I have for the church and, and for our church as well, that sometimes we flip this and we say, oh no, the kingdom witnesses for our church. We fall into this temptation where we do that. In Matthew 24, 13 through 14, it says, stay with it, staying with it. That's what God requires. Stay with it to the end. You won't be sorry and, you, and you'll be saved. 
All during this time, the good news, the message of the kingdom will be preached all over the world, a witness staked out in every country, and then the end will come. This is where Jesus is foreshadowing the end. And he's saying, no, there will be come a time where this goes away, and it's going to be hard for you. It's going to be hard for you, which is something I don't think, at least here in America, we really have a really good idea of, because frankly, it's pretty easy to be a Christian here. It's pretty easy. We don't need to be the witness for the kingdom. And so our problem is, is that again, we've flipped it. And we say, the kingdom is the witness for our church. Look, person on the street, look, there's something really good out there, so come to my church. Look, there's a way that you can have peace and joy and happiness, but, but come, come here. You got to come here. I can show it to you. I can do it at my church. I can show you it at my church. Now, hear me. I'm not saying that we don't witness. We're absolutely directed to witness. And I'm not saying we don't invite people to church. Coming to church is a very good thing. We're here, right? <laughs> but when we say, no, 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 we use the kingdom so that we can ha grow your numbers or your fame or money or influence, that's when we get it flipped. And we say, no, no, look, the kingdom is there, but you have to find it here. No, 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 no. The church was made for us to gather, to be here, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but so that we can witness and bring the kingdom outside, not have people come inside here. The king Again, remember, this is not the kingdom. So we have to be aware of this, and, and this is my, again, this is, this is my concern, this is what I'm worried about for the church and my prayer for the church is that we've flipped this, we've gotten this flipped. Because, like we talked about, the church is just an instrument for the kingdom. That's really what we are. That's really what the church is. It's a way and the instrument that God is using to continue and to finish his work here on earth. We're an instrument that can point people to him. We're the instrument that goes and finishes the work of Jesus Christ, which frankly was, was pretty basic. Feed the hungry, clothe the needy, and, worship, and point to God and worship Jesus. That was what this whole thing was set up. That's what Jesus' work is. So that's what he calls the church and what the church is, is an instrument of the kingdom to bring those things to the people. Again, though, this is the concern, right, when we flip this. When we forget that the kingdom is higher, and the church is just an instrument, and the church becomes the thing that is all important, well, that's when we get Jesus plus. That's when we get Jesus plus this, Jesus plus that, Jesus plus anything. And then we become the Pharisees. Because that's, if, if we look at that, even during Jesus' time, that's what the Pharisees did, and that's what Jesus calls them out so many times and says, look, you've got it wrong. You've created rules and lists and things that people have to do. I've called you to, to these very few things. Love God. Love your neighbor. These two things fulfill all of the rules that are placed in. But when we forget about that and we forget those are two basic rules, then we do Jesus plus, Jesus plus, Jesus plus, and we're no longer an instrument of the kingdom. So we have to remember that. So what? <laughs> cool. Great talk. Um, again, thanks, thanks Brad. Uh, answer the ult ultimate question, don't cause a church split. And what do I do? Like, those are all good. Like, I think we can all shake our head and agree, like, yeah, those are, those are, find things. Those are things we shouldn't, we shouldn't get it, we shouldn't get switched. But what do we do? What does that look like for me? What's the purpose then of coming here? 
What's the purpose of being here? What are we supposed to do as the church then? I think a couple times, um, too many times, that we as Christians, and I'm, I'll be honest, I'm guilty of this myself, we approach church and our role in the kingdom more like this. Like a Peter Gibbons. Uh-huh. Oh, there you are. We're just talking about you. You must be Peter Gibbons. Uh-huh. Terrific. I'm Bob Slidell. This is my associate, Bob Porter. Uh, hi, Bob. Bob? If you want to go ahead and grab a seat and join us for a minute or two. You see, what we're actually trying to do here is we're just... We're trying to get a feel for how people spend their day at work. So, if you would, would you walk us through a typical day for you? Yeah. Great. Well, I generally come in at least 15 minutes late. Uh, I use the side door. That way, Lumberg can't see me. <laughs> and uh, after that, I just sort of space out for about an hour. Tell uh, uh, space out? Yeah. I just stare at my desk, but it looks like I'm working. I do that for uh, probably another hour after lunch, too. I'd say in a given week, I probably only do about 15 minutes of real, actual work. I think sometimes, right, we, we end up taking that approach because this is what it looks like to church for us, right? And that's the very thing, and that's, why, and that's why I'm on board with what Brad is trying to do, is that we have to be outside of ourselves. We have to be outside of here, because that's what the purpose is. Now, I think there's three purposes, and we can see them in Scripture, of what the church is actually, what our job is, and what our role is. Three, three main purposes. The first one is worship. The first one is worship. We talk about, Paul talks about this as well. He goes, it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us, designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose is working out in everything and everyone. This worship of our own lives. It's all of us. It's not just singing. I mean, singing's great. You should do it. But that's not the only act of worship. Our lives are an act of worship. Our lives are supposed to be an act of worship that we live out every single day. That's a hard ask. That's a hard call. And Paul also talks to the Colossians even directly about saying, so uh, I'll, I'll give it to you here. We should do it. We should worship in song and in scripture and in prayer. He says, instruct and direct one another using good common sense and sing. Sing your hearts out. To God, let every detail of your lives, words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of the Master Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. So, worship is so important. We start it off, that's the very beginning of the service here, because it's not just preparing us or preparing our hearts to receive whatever it is that God's going to say. It doesn't just put us in a nice place. It doesn't just make us happy. Those are all things that worship does do, and they're good things. But on its most and even more fundamental basic level, worship fulfills one of the prime purposes of the church, just the act of worship. Because we were created by God to have a relationship with him and to worship him. That was our very basic purpose at the very beginning. And so that's, that's what we're here for. So worship and singing is not just a primer to the sermon or something else. It actually is the purpose of the church, what, it, this was, what this is created for. The second purpose is to nurture everyone that's here, everybody out there, is to nurture. We see that again in Colossians. And Paul says, we preach Christ warning people not to add to the message. We teach in a spirit of profound common sense so that we can bring each person to maturity. And this is one of the things that I really like, and you probably have heard it about three or four times now today already. To be mature is to be basic. Christ, 
no more, no less. It's a basic message, but it's an important message because it's easy to be quiet. I'll be honest with you here. It's easier in my own life. I'm, I struggle with this every day to be Jesus plus because I struggle and I sit here and I say, I have to earn. I have to be good enough. I have to do more things. If I do enough stuff, then maybe Jesus will love me because he is so holy and so high. I can never attain that, but maybe I can, I can, I can do enough stuff. So, so Christ plus is, is, is where we can get to. But the other side is also the same, where we can say Christ is a pretty high burden. It's a pretty high standard. Like, that's what we're talking about. It's a basic message, but it's a high standard. And so then we slip over and we say, no, no, it's okay, though. It's okay to be over here because you, you'll never measure up to Christ, so don't, so don't worry. You don't have to change. You can keep doing exactly what you were doing before coming to Christ. It's okay because it's a high standard. No, no, the, the answer simply is Christ. And that's what maturity looks like. And that's the part of the nurturing. So in these three purposes, it also talks about how we, and again, it's a basic message. I'm sure you've, you're all here on Father's Day and not in the mountains, so I'm sure you've heard a sermon about this before. But it's how we interact with God, which is the worship, right? It's how we interact with each other, right, in this room and the people that show up here. That's the nurturing. We're spurring each other on towards discipleship. It's the nurturing so that we can all present ourselves and each other as mature believers and whenever our time comes to meet the Father. However that looks, we want to be standing there saying, Christ, no more, no less. That's my standard. And then finally, the third purpose is beyond these walls. How do we interact? What's the purpose of the church outside? And again, it's very basic. It's not to fix people. We can't do that. Only the Holy Spirit can. But it's evangelism and mercy. That's what it looks like. That's the purpose and the posture that we take outside these walls to people that are not believers evangelism, and mercy. Again, be careful. What's not up there is a, is a judgment on somebody. It's a call to action, but it's not a judgment. If you look through the course of the Bible with people that are the religious scholars, the people that are in that's the calls that Jesus makes to repentance and to say, no, 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 you're not doing it right. You're causing a problem. To everybody who's outside, to the prostitutes, to the tax collectors, to everyone else, it's a posture of mercy. And that's the heart posture that we need to take. He makes that call. He says, he doesn't just let them stay where they're at, right? That's the less than Christ. He doesn't let them stay there. He says, no, no, come to me. Your sins are forgiven. There was no precondition. Now go sin no more. Now that you're in. But on, if you're out, it's a posture of mercy. And that's the posture that we have to take. He tells us, directly to everyone. He says, I tell you, love your enemies. Help and give without expecting a return. You'll never, I promise, regret it. Live out this God-created identity the way our Father lives towards us, generously and graciously, even when we're at our worst. Our Father is kind, so you be kind. This is Jesus' directions to his disciples after he's telling them, Go out there and evangelize. P 
people are going to be really mean to you. <laughs> they will hate you. This is how you respond. This is the response even for those that don't like us. This is the heart posture that we take outside the walls. These are the three purposes because ultimately, and this is the hope. This is my hope. I know that there's been some like tough stuff, but the hope here and the purpose here is that one day, and why I still believe in the church for all its flaws, for all the issues at the church, the big C church, all the churches here in town, regardless of their, you know, their denomination, whether it's us or it's Front Range or the Rock or the Presbyterian Church or the Anglican Church, for all of our faults and flaws, and even this one, right? I'll be honest, if anyone here is sitting in this room thinking that this is a perfect church, um, <laughs> I don't know who you talk to. We're not. We never will be. Because we're living in the, the kingdom is here, but not yet. So this isn't a perfect church. And it would be easier to walk away and just say, oh, you guys don't have it right. I'm going to go, I'm going to go do it on my own. I can do it. But the truth of the matter is, is that there will come a day where we get to go stand in front of the Father. And for me, at least, I would much rather have that experience, say, when I step up there and it comes my turn, and I say, and he says, well, you know what? Actually, you got it a little bit wrong um, with the church. It, 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 I actually meant this a little bit. So, so it, was, it was close, but, you know, this is what I, you got this little part wrong. I would much rather have that interaction because the words that follow up after that are the fact that, but you were there, you were working, you're in the ground, and you know what? Yep, you got it a little bit wrong, but good news. What I see is Jesus. So welcome, good and faithful servant. Enjoy your rest. The alternative is by walking away and saying, nah, the church is messed up, the church is screwed up. It is. I'll give it to you. So I'm going to do it my own way. I'll, I can do it. I'll be spiritual without going to church. The problem is then we have that same conversation. And Jesus already tells us what's going to happen. Because we've said, I know better than you how to live this life. I know better than you what the purpose is. And we're going to do a lot of good things. You'll do a lot of good things. But the words are then going to be, I didn't know you. I didn't know you. So I'd much rather, I'll stick, <laughs> I'll stick over here. I'll work to make it as, as best we can, to be the best instrument of the kingdom, to make sure that the church is the witness for the kingdom, that the church is worshiping God, that we're nurturing inside these walls, and that we're working with spreading the gospel, letting people know, and taking a posture of mercy outside these walls. I'd much rather be in that camp whenever I get to meet Jesus. I'd much rather be in that camp, even for the imperfections, even for the flaws, because he sees Jesus in front of that. That's what he sees. So when we see the flaw, when we see the mistake, God sees Jesus, because he already paid that price so we don't have to. That's the hope. That's where I rest, that even for the church, as the best church, the worst church, it is flawed because the kingdom is here and not yet. And I rest in the fact that no matter what, that's the beauty that makes it, that, that's what makes it beautiful, is that we can go to different churches. There can be different gatherings of people but we rest in the oneness that is Jesus. And that's where we stay, and that's where we stand ultimately. So no matter the hurts, the flaws, we stand with Jesus covering all of that. For us individually, and, and thankfully for us as a group as well, that's what we see, is God sees Jesus and he sees his blood. So 
I told Brad, I said, well, this is how I'll end. And he said, good, you can do as much heresy as you want. I'll clean it up next week, but there just has to be three questions at the end. It's the only requirement. So I said, okay, I'll come up with three questions. Um, and this is what they are. And again, as Brad says, we do these questions not because you're going to necessarily have the answers, but what we want is we want to be able to take this and go. If, if this is all that it is, I don't know, hopefully I said something nice and you liked it, whatever. But if this is it, if this doesn't go outside the walls, then, again, we're not fulfilling that, the actual purpose. There's all three of them. We've got to get all three of, of, the, of those purposes. So one of the questions, and this is, this is uh, here's, here's my heresy uh, for the day, but is the kingdom of God a good or bad metaphor for the church right now? I think it's an interesting question. Uh, I have my own thoughts on it, so you can come find me some other time and we'll talk about it. How do we make sure that the church, whether it's this church or the church in general, stays within the boundaries of what the kingdom actually looks like? How do we not get it flipped? And then which one of those three purposes of the church do you feel most drawn to fulfilling? Spoiler alert on that one, uh, you're called to do all three. You don't get to pick one and neglect the others. But we all have a role. And so what, what part do you feel most drawn to? That one I'm just curious. So we'll have these three questions. Um, we've got one more song to just reflect on. So as we sing this song, let's reflect on that. Let's, let's fulfill that first purpose of just worship the heart of God. That's what we're made for.